It's only been 117 days since IFT2, and my god, when I say IFT3 was way better than IFT2, I think that's an understatement. It did way better than the past flight. Significant improvement over the last flight. Upgrade software, hardware, and everything in between made this way more successful than last time. To give you a quick summary what happened during IFT2. The whole thing went flawlessly. All 33 Raptor engines ignited at liftoff went all the way up to hot staging, the first hot stage from a starship. After that, the booster started to have multitudes of issues, a possible filter issue, and maybe also some fuel sloshing caused the whole vehicle to go kaboomy. The ship, meanwhile, continued going up almost making it to Seco, but prior to that, a fire broke out in the engine bay and simultaneously caused a raptor to explode and I think you know where that goes. FTS initiated and the vehicle was lost. This time, however, SpaceX did get to the orbital ish trajectory insertion and also made the booster return all the way back down into the gulf of mexico for this test it was a very hard landing going around 1100 kilometers per hour into the water at touchdown but we'll get into that later why that happened but this was not just oh we're flying it and you know see what happens there was actual tests conducted on this, including a propellant transfer, a payload door test, and a Raptor relight in orbit. Two of those were tested. One of them was aborted. We'll get into that also later. But for now, let's rewind the clock to around T minus one minute. So funny enough, our team was out on site. Joey and Kay were both there looking across at the foggy conditions. Unfortunately, the launch site was pretty fogged out. But besides that just being the main concern, well, also clouds were overhead, so we were concerned that we wouldn't see anything. But luckily clouds were able to clear out. It was spotty, but we did see Starship lift off after it cleared the fog, which was about 10 seconds into flight. We were live the whole time during this whole thing, around a full nine hours on TikTok and X, and I was live on my own personal channel rebroadcasting it to YouTube. Meanwhile, while I was losing my sanity for the count, SpaceX was navigating boats out of the hazard area. This kept delaying the T-0 several times throughout the countdown. This also caused me, again, to lose my sanity and probably everybody else's. But when they finally cleared the boats, they were ready to go. Starting at T-1 minute in counting, they said there might be a hold at T-40 seconds, however, that didn't happen because the winds were in flight limits. There was a concern that the wind shear in the upper atmosphere was going to be a problem, but luckily, it wasn't. It was in flight range. Everybody was very concerned about that, but it went off without a hitch. Around T-10 seconds, obviously we have the classic countdown. Around T-5 seconds, the steel plate initiated its deluge and caused, you know, the nice shower of water going at 30 bar out of the launch pad, shielding the pad from getting a concrete tornado. <clears throat> IFT1. Anyway, everything went flawless. All 33 Raptor engines lit. They pretty much mastered that at this point already. It's pretty impressive. We cleared the tower, avoidance maneuver from the tower, and everything looked flawless. And this time we had onboard views. Thank God, because I was going to lose my mind if we didn't have any cameras on board. And we also had ship views, not just booster views. So everything went flawless. We went through Max-Q and also went supersonic. All things looking well, similar to IFT2. Around that point is when a lot of people lost track of it on the ground, but SpaceX, of course, had the best show with cameras on board. As we approached hot staging, we got our first view from the ship, what a hot stage looks like. And my goodness, I can tell you, I tripped out when I saw that from the ship view, but I want my engine cam view. Th that's what I want, SpaceX. With all that being said, the booster flipped around a lot slower than last time, not as dynamic as it was last time, a lot more controlled this time. But And all 
of the engines lit up this time. Not like one out and then slowly fading out. The whole thing lit up, which was good. All the engines running on the boost backburn when they initiated. And we seem to be running flawless this time. But there is one thing I want to note. While the ship was going on in the background, you had a cool view of the ship leaving. But there's also one more thing I wanted to point out with the booster at the boost back burn near the end. The shutdown of the boost back burn. Now, keep in mind, all this is just speculation at this point. But it did seem like the cutoff was a little wonky. Not like a good synchronized cutoff. Usually, SpaceX has a pattern to shut down um, these engines in a more synchronized way. This time, just one side completely shut off, and then a few more on the other side, and then the other two. It, it was messy. So I have an odd suspicion that that side might have just completely shut down early, and then the other side shut down normally. It's also another proven fact, later in the flight, none of those engines on that side lit at all. But, that could be due to other reasons. Anyway, once the burn was finished, everything was shut down, the booster slowly reached its apogee, and then started rapidly declining through the atmosphere. Now, keep in mind, Super Heavy does not have an entry burn. The entry burn is non-existent with Super Heavy. With Falcon it is, because without an entry burn on Falcon, the vehicle would pretty much not exist um, after the atmosphere. Super Heavy is made out of stainless steel, so it can actually gun through the atmosphere. So it came in, I think, around its top speed was like uh, 4,400 kilometers per hour. Pretty fast. It was zipping through the cloud layers. But, you know, the grid fins were doing their work. We saw the grid fins actually do work. Like, real work for the atmosphere. Actually, you could see them heating up from the speed and friction. But we are, we were all anticipating the, how's the landing gonna work? And how, how all this is gonna come down to. They go to light the engines and only three out of the, what, 13 that are supposed to be lit? Uh-oh. That doesn't seem good. And it wasn't. Uh, and actually, only two successfully lit. One aborted midway through its startup sequence. So, two ignited, and then one failed later on, and then it was one engine trying to hold the whole thing back, which obviously wasn't enough, and the booster smashed into the water at a good 1,100 kilometers per second. Yeah, not good, but that's gonna be reviewed by SpaceX, and we'll see how that data uh, correlates to everything that happened. So, we'll have to see how that progresses through time, but for right now... Uh, that was a really good first attempt at a water landing. And to be fair, Falcon had several hard landings. <laughs> the poor drone ship, of course, I still love you. But this was pretty controlled compared to Falcon's past. And the fact that it even was trying to control itself and you could see the booster fighting for control really showed how many backup systems and how hard it was trying to slow down. But of course... We need more engines online to slow this thing. So it will probably take a few more tests to get that perfect. But hopefully for the next few tests, already from what we've experienced from IFT 1 to 3, we've seen major improvements just in that short time. It's been not even a full year since the first test flight, but we're coming up on In that short time, we've seen three test flights and back over to the ship now. So the ship was continuing on while the booster was doing its main hooray show in the sky and falling through the atmosphere. While this was all happening, the ship was just cruising along. Everything was performing nominally. This one was the most successful, and everybody was anticipating that shutdown. I was starting to get on the edge of my seat. When shutdown occurred, I can tell you for a fact, I lost my mind. Yeah, we don't talk about that. Anyway, after shutdown, they were prepping for all the series of tests since they had a limited window of time to test things before re-entry because they landed in the Indian Ocean this time instead of Hawaii. So the first test that was tested was the payload door and then propellant transfer and then, well, the other one was aboard later. 
So the propellant transfer and the payload door took place around the same time. Payload door was first. Now, the payload door seemed to open slightly, but maybe not fully. We still don't know the full details on this, so take this with a complete grain of salt, but it seemed to have some issues. Later in flight, you could see it trying to close itself, but it seemed like it only opened like slightly. Again, it's a test door, and they this is the first time they ever opened it in space after a launch and a lot of vibrations, but you know, it was still technically a failure from what we could see. Meanwhile, we more recently just got news that, that the propellant transfer was actually successful. And that's a really good thing because NASA gave SpaceX a contract, which I believe was $163 million, if I recall correctly, that to perform that test. So, hey, a little demonstration was done and it seemed to work, which is a really good step forward. But... We will need to see a full scale done with ships docking to each other and like fully fueling each other up, which will come probably, if I were to guess, next year. After both of these tests were done, they were getting ready for the relight in space burn. The ship was prepping for this uh, in space burn, but seems like Starship had other things planned. Uh, it did not take place. Probably because the flight computer aborted it. There was probably some un nominal conditions for that. Do we really want to risk a uh, Raptor exploding in space before testing the reentry portion? No. But coming up on reentry. Now, this was a weird part. Is also during this whole time, Starship was spinning and spinning and spinning. And spinning and spinning and spinning, you got it. Uh, but it seemed like um, the RCS was not working anymore. And it was coming uncontrollably into a spinning tumble barrel roll uh, into the atmosphere. Which was uh, not good because it was not facing heat shield fully. And later on in re-entry, it was an interesting time for Starship. Despite it literally going upside down at one point, this thing was able to survive a good portion of re-entry, at least a partial re-entry, before it blew. The whole thing was literally upside down via the graphic. Um, yeah, that's not good. But also, stainless steel itself was in the heating instead of the heat shield, so it was well, actually, it was torching the engine bay, torching the hull on the back side that's not supposed to be, instead of fully torching the heat shield. It was like half of the heat shield. But anyway, Starship starts, you know, kind of tumbling and having problems, and then we lose signal. But it lasted so long with it coming in uncontrollably. It, it's kind of crazy uh, how that all took place. And I, I'm still processing it. It's like, did that really happen? Did we really? And that's the other thing. Did we really have onboard views the whole time this thing was going through the atmosphere? Yes, Starlink was providing us live views of this thing burning itself alive. Anyway, uh, overall, a very successful test, uh, but there are still improvements to be made. Um, for all the things that SpaceX has done, um, this is remarkable that this thing even works. Keep in mind, it's twice the thrust of the Saturn V, taller than the Saturn V, and it somehow works. And is also planning to be fully reusable. They attempted reusability, but it's not quite there yet. At the rate that they're showing, technically Starship be could become an operational rocket sometime by the middle of this year, if everything goes right. And SpaceX says there's... Plans for around six more this year. We'll have to see how that holds, but I would say at least three to four in the coming months. Anyway, that pretty much wraps this video up. If you guys enjoyed and have anything else that you would want to add, well, first of all, hit the like button, subscribe, 
and also leave a comment down below about if I missed anything or anything valuable that you would want to add. For the most part, uh, this is uh, the social media supervisor of Interstellar Gateway signing off until next time.